Thank you very much, Tiddly. And um, just uh, thank you very much for Jaren, the leader smashing team, for having me here. And good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you happen to be. I'm Steph, I'm very glad to meet you. As uh, Vitaly mentioned very briefly, I am the head of research at DXW. We are a UK digital agency specializing in creating public services that improve lives. And prior to joining DXW, I you know, apart from having had other heads of research roles, I also freelanced for a while as a strategist and consultant for many years. And the majority of the stories I'll share with you today come from those times. And um, so, <laughs> Um, so I was putting this talk together a while ago, and one of the things I realized is that the stories I want to tell is actually, in fact, quite a personal journey that despite having you know, led a full stack development team, several uh, full stack development teams at this point, and, um, and I was a full stack developer myself once upon a time, and having spent some years leading a team that includes information architects, interaction designers, and visual designers, why, after all that, I pretty much identify myself more as a researcher and, and how I see research as a vital part of our design tool set that we use to make positive change where it matters. So not only in the sense of understanding customers or user needs, but in the power of building evidence over time, using it to make good decisions, including ethical ones and important ones. So um, I like to address in this talk you know, why we sometimes think about research as sort of in design circles and we might be doing ourselves a disservice by just adopting a rather narrow vantage point and then how we might do it differently. So this is very much a talk about lessons learned. Um, the, um, uh, about lessons learned, failures, <laughs> as Vitaly was saying, things that didn't work. So I'm, I'm going to be sort of stacking a few stories back to back. Um, and there won't be quite a lot of visuals, maybe just in the first few little bit. So if you, you know, it's a sort of talk to the design for you to put on your Bluetooth headphones if you want to wander away and just listen. It's, you know, it's that kind of talk to be designed for that kind of experience because, you know, we're all online remote these days. So I came from a computer science background. And at that time in the 90s, we were still trained to think in terms of code efficiency, we were taught to write code with the minimum number of computing cycles because it was cheaper, computationally cheaper. We would look at algorithms, compare them in terms of complexity, how many functional calls, how many nested loops, details like that, whether it was more cost effective as a program to save your things to memory or, or not, or to drive, or to your disk drive. Some of you here probably remember those days. Um, but everything had a cost, and the goal was to make robust systems that not only didn't fall over, but just didn't cost the planet. It amounts to things like performance, the speed of execution, and electricity. So if you think about you know, things like blockchain today, you can understand how much this hurts a little bit. Um, we didn't have at that time the computing power or that limitless magic cloud storage that we have now. So those kinds of considerations were important. But as we all know, we live in quite a different world today. We have an excess of computing power and we will have more. We have a lot of data and we want more data and we will have more. To some degree, we can afford those kinds of inefficiencies and barely notice it. Now, obviously there's a different conversation here about whether it's environmentally friendly or not, and that's a different discussion to have. But when we think about building the right thing, it's not always about being more, it's about choice. It's about making informed decisions and how you chart these potential paths to success. And the trick is to know that we actually have a choice we can make and how we make these choices when it matters. So starting from the 90s, I want to take you forward to 2008, um, or from now back to 2008, it's quite a while ago. Just to give you, um, ground you um, a place in time. The first iPhone was announced in January just um, just a year before in 2007 and was released a couple of months later. Eric Ries, known for Lean Startup Methodology, had just begun his work then, but the actual book was not published until 2011 in September, quite a few years later. And also sort of in terms of design history, Ethan Marcotte's seminal article on responsive design was published two years later, uh, May 25th, 2010. So we knew that the mobile revolution was coming, it was inevitable, but we weren't quite there yet at this point in time. Just to nail you that at that point in time, if that remember how it feels like. I was living and working in the city called Montreal, and um, I, uh, the 
several things happened to me because of a blog post I wrote on loving books. And the, to the left here is a photo, uh, one of the photos of my, not, not my book, it was just a photo of a book that I took in the museum. And to the right was a cozy little Japanese restaurant where my co-founder at the time and I met for lunch for the first time and hatched some plans. My co-founder is and was a killer person called Hugh McGuire, who also founded, amongst other things, LibriVox, which is a platform for crowdsourced audiobooks. And more recently, Pressbooks, an open source book publishing platform, which are focused on one aspect of one of the things we explored in the product that we built together called Book Oven. I'll tell you a secret, way back when we didn't use the word product when we should have, no service when we should have. Anyway, the problem we were trying to tackle is something that might make some of our friends at Smashing Magazine smile. Um, it's called the right to publish process, which hasn't changed much, and it still looks like this today. 14 years on, I'm a published writer now, and I get tasked that this process has not changed. You basically, you write and edit, you write and edit until you're ready, you have it proofread, you put in the formatting in the framework, and you publish it. And with the book oven, at that time, I was fresh of um, having been a director of technology in an agency and I was freelancing. So I agreed to help you with you know, pitching for funding. Um, so this was actually part of our original deck. So this was about 14 years ago. I'm going to tell you now, warn you that the visuals and the screenshots um, are, are going to be a bit dated. Please promise me you won't laugh or you can laugh when I won't hear you. So I guess that's probably okay. Um, these images are of their time and uh, think of them as archival. So here we, we have an you know, illustration of the idea that you would create manuscripts as writers and you would collaborate with a bunch of people, writers, editors, reviewers, colleagues, your proofreaders, your designers. And eventually once you package it up, you want to be able to sort of like, you know, push it onto many platforms. Now this doesn't sound like much today, but back in 2008, we're talking about the time when um, we're starting to read the Kindle um, on the phone, so you know it was starting to be a thing. So it, it was it was a weird, bizarre thought then. Um, so here are some screenshots of what you know, the thing we built. Timeline was a thing back then. You might remember that. You, you know we could create individual chapters. You can comment on the work as a whole within this platform that we built. You can comment on um, uh, sorry on individual chapters, the whole chapter, and on the paragraph. Now. That sounds like nothing today, but JavaScript wasn't powerful enough at the time for us to target specific characters like the way we can do now. And then there was this thing that we built because uh, I, I think we had a couple of beers and was like, well, what if we make proofreading easier and less painful for everybody? So we would do this thing. It's like, you know, we did a proof of concept. We would have Gutenberg text, so like, you know, um, um, so it's historical text, that, and things like classics. We would split them up into individual sentences um, and then showing only one sentence at a time. So you can only edit one sentence at a time. Um, and then, you know, just have one before, one after for context. And you can sort of like crowdsource the whole concept of proofreading. Um, like good people who care about user experience, we did some research. Now, we didn't have a lot of money, um, but we found somebody who had contacts in the literary world gave her a guideline of what we were looking for. And, you know, she was a former journalist, so, you know, she conducted interviews on our behalf. It was quite informal, and we snowballed it to some degree. Now, um, uh, snowball is a technical word in, in the sort of research world for word of mouth trying to recruit participants because you don't have a budget for that. So we snowballed it. Um, and one of the things that we found was that people who work in more traditional industry, um, so traditional publishing industry, didn't quite get what we were doing. But the people who love you know, blogging, text, and, you know, and reading on mobile, they, they got what we're doing. So there's this huge like you know, rift down the middle. But instead of thinking, like stopping there and finding out more, we just kept chugging along because at the time, we didn't really understand the context of what we were working in. And we did a lot of things that we thought were right. Um, you know, we evaluated our competition in terms of features. We um, uh, you know, had a nice little grids like this, but as it turned out, it was not the right thing to do. The wisdom I would acquire so much later on in life was that features were only a small part of why someone adopts your product or don't come near it. It's features only a small, small part of that decision. And we thought, you know, maybe our main competitors were Google Docs and Microsoft Word. At the time, Google Docs was quite new. You couldn't edit in line the way you can do now. You could just comment. And because like I said, JavaScript was too minimal. And years later, this is what people still use today in the industry. Our greatest barriers were, was not just the idea of this competition um, landscape, is that the habits that writers and the publishing industry have don't change. 
So after a few years after that project, um, I myself went through a quite a painful process um, trying to be a development editor for the second edition of um, Aaron Gustafson's book, Adaptive Web Design. We authored in Google Docs, translated templates to Word, um, you know, and now even myself as an author using a combination of Word, Dropbox or, um, or Google Docs for managing critiques. You know, to some degree, <clears throat> for the book oven, we did nearly everything I would have considered best practice for the way we run the team and the way we did our process. But at the end of the day, we were a solution looking for a problem. So ever since that project, I kind of feel like I've been atoning for my sins. Catch 22. If you're making something that doesn't exist yet, how will people know if they want it? There's also this arguments, I think, that we see um, when people believe they're built working on something new and novel. And I, I have a feeling that that was also how we felt at the time. And another philosophical question, because I like them, is it bad design if there's nobody to use it? And what I later realized is that these were probably the wrong ways to understand what was going on. For the rest of this talk, and for context, when I use the word design, I would like us to think about capital D design, not just how things look, how it functions, but how it feels and how it makes us feel. Justifying the wrong problem. Now, this one is something that happens probably more commonly than we realize. Because quite often in the industry, when we're handed a problem to solve, often it's not the right one. And this is fast forward 10 years later. I was leading a small team of researchers um, in an organization that produced content. So at the time, the company that we're working for wanted, needed, a new and different revenue stream. And up until that point, like many content companies, we survived on advertising. I assumed that somebody did the math because we were just told we were going to launch a premium content service. So a premium content service means that's, that's part of the content that's going to be fenced off and paid for, a premium service. But nobody apparently had actually asked the questions. What would people actually want to pay for? And so we had to go and find out. Um, and I had three levels of management who didn't quite understand the kind of evidence user research could bring to the table. So what did people find valuable enough that they were willing to pay for was an interesting question. And if we put a paywall around our content, was it actually going to have negative consequences? Would people, no, we just lose our audience and entirely and also you know, um, ebb away our advertising revenue. And so, we did a round of research, a, a very large qualitative round in the realms of like over 20 interviews around brand perception. So when we talk about brand perception, um, it's easy to think about it as market research, but it was not like this at all. We connected it to a product offering. We you know, had users show us the content that they cared about. So it's nothing like attitude in the market research, but we actually connected it to the product experience. And, um, and we dive deep into people's emotions when they interact with the content. So for the savvy among you, I conducted jobs to be done research. And we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A if you want. The questions were, was our brand strong enough? Did it have an emotional enough draw that people would pay for it? You know? um, and what kind of emotions were they? Were they positive or negative? And also, how did people perceive value? What was our value proposition? Um, the things that we thought we were promising to customers, did they believe that we promised that to them? Did we have that match? And were we fulfilling that promise well? So on, on the upside, it was one of the rare occasions that I worked in, although it's now, I want to say I've had many more experiences. And it, this was particularly memorable. Um, we had data science, analytics teams, collaborating with design research and market research. So we all branded, um, banded together around this high profile project. But the ship has sailed, left the harbor, chickens on the coop, pick your favorite metaphor. Whatever work that we were able to have done at that point, it was to mitigate potential disaster, basically. And it wasn't research to help us find the right strategic path. It was kind of too late. The decision was already made. We were going to have this thing, so let's find out how to do it. It wasn't like, it wasn't an exploration of what could we have done things differently in order to achieve the same result. Do you see the difference? So, but it was nearly always the root cause. So many times when people like you and me get involved in a project, the decision of this stuff we're making has already been decided. 
and is usually someone's top-down idea. And there, there are many competing ideas internally within an organization, for example, or maybe somebody won a political battle. The problem is we'd be lucky if we validated we're building the things right through research, but when what really mattered was we needed to know if we were building the right thing because there was not enough time, probably not enough budget, and we only had one shot. And usually the cause of these problems tend to be the hunger for somebody to be a genius. Without early research to truly understand the potential context of views, any idea seems like a brilliant idea until you execute and launch it, by which time it's nearly impossible to tell if the idea was a bad one or if the execution isn't quite right. So when you don't have the reflex to do some research the moment the idea pops into existence, you're setting yourself up for high risks of failure. The challenge is, you know, someone is really convinced that the idea would work, especially someone's in power. So it's probably not a surprise that our usual habit is to respond to that, um, to use research to validate the idea rather than to question it. I have so many examples of things built just like this in my 20 years of working for the web. Things I have made, things that my teams have made over the years, stories um, made by people, other, other people like us. We have given ourselves the permission to launch things with limited evidence that they would work or would work only in narrowly defined contexts. So often they don't work at all or make no impact despite what passed for evidence. Now, what I'm saying is, yes, it's true that some research is done, but is it the right type of research, right? Yes, you know, designers and researchers are often involved a little bit earlier than software engineers, but is it the right question we're asking? For someone who started out in computer programming, counting the number of times a loop runs with an algorithm, sometimes this feels like a lot of waste. Building the wrong thing is incredibly wasteful. But before I want to talk about how we built the right thing, or at least change that conversation on pushing to this building the right thing, there is an issue we need to address briefly. And it's this infatuation with continuous failing. For many long years, we've had terrible processes. We still have them sometimes, um, and even though sometimes they're disguised. We have and still have waterfall processes um, that with each step contains increased risk. So if a design specification that wasn't quite right in the beginning, for the idea that wasn't quite right in the beginning, it would likely have consequences exacerbated later on at a much greater cost. So collectively over time, I want to say in the last few decades, we decided that we have much less risk with lean, agile processes, because it should, in theory, be able to course correct. However, I want to say the jury might be a little bit out on this, because more often than not, once we've spent the time, the effort, and the cash on something, it's a lot harder to pivot away from it, because we need to now justify that you know, to ourselves that our blood, sweat, and tears hadn't been wasted. Now, we're actually building things with minimal evidence. It's not just about launching things that are imperfect, we're now building them faster. We're obsessed with failing fast and doing things faster. Build faster, fail faster, move fast, break things, you know all the slogans. Without necessarily giving thought to the consequence of what you might break if you didn't know the context of what you were building within. I'll just repeat that because it's quite a bit of a mouthful. We might be building things faster, breaking things, without necessarily giving thought to the consequence of what might break if we didn't know the context of what we're building within. It's a bit of a common scenario. Um, and I say this commonly because I've had several clients come up to me at different points in my lifetime saying that uh, they have to make revenue. They have to make financial returns before the product is ready. Our lean, agile culture has somehow been translated to this. Build faster, fail faster, make some revenue as early as possible. And I wonder whether we, who needs to take responsibility for this? Could it be us? No, no th those of us who design and build, maybe we convince people that this was possible. But whatever it is, now we are seduced by the idea that if you, you can start making money with something that is less than finished. In one of these stories, one of them is in my pocket. Um, someone in the product manager type got in touch with me a few years ago now to help them with something that they wanted to launch. Um, it was, uh, I'm sorry I can't tell you who it is or what they did because the downside of doing early research is that sometimes a bunch of things are under NDA. 
Um, so they, it was an interesting product, very beautifully designed, compelling story, a bit of niggles in the UI, but nothing serious. However, they were nowhere near able to deliver it. And they may not have done the right research around where to sit in the market and where they sit in terms of audience expectations. And I want to say, I'm not even sure they should have built in the first place because they were entering a very fierce competitive space where other platforms have existed for at least a couple of decades. It might have been interesting to say, yeah, we're gonna build something better and nicer. It's just gonna have better user experience, but there might have been another opportunity that they didn't think about. There might have been a different way to fulfill that promise and probably make some revenue instead of building the wrong thing or something that may not actually hit the notes. Making something as good as you can make it is no longer quite so important somehow because people seem to be more interested in seeing, to be seen building the thing. Releasing the product with imperfections is now our dominating mantra. Um, and I mean, you know, it's, it's not entirely, I know that there's no the whole thing about being too perfectionistic, but not doing our due diligence has consequences. And, and, you know, just about everybody has been seduced by that novelty of building our own because everybody wants to be a hero tech entrepreneur. Secretly, everyone inside wants to be Steve Jobs. Separating the idea from execution. Otherwise, what I call killing the genius softly without a song. Peter Morville is one of the founding fathers of information architecture. And, um, and he said these words, if engineers plan, fail to plan, bridges collapse and people die. And we're now learning the hard way that the consequences of bad software are no less dire. I would go a little further to say that in order to plan, you need evidence. The right kind of evidence to form your plan so that you have the best chance of succeeding and also do justice to your customers, your clients, your citizens. How can we as designers these researchers, developers, people who build, get into that conversation early enough and ask the right questions. Honestly, it's possible because I'm not on the other side and in the place where I'm working now, that's what we do. I've just come off two rounds of discovery work. But that is something that has taken years of culture change and we owe our ability to do that to processes established within government digital services here in the UK. It is also possible to do it in commercial context and I know teams that have successfully done it, but these tend to be fewer and far between when this should be happening much more often. It's just that most people don't actually realize the capability of design research and how to talk about it and, and what questions we can answer. Number one, the timing of research is key. It's like a muscle reflex. An organization needs to have this reflex at the top tier of management. Sometimes it takes a little while to get there. In the story I mentioned earlier, you know, about the content organization I was working within, I managed to get the attention of some of the core leadership and that they could see what else could have done differently. And sometimes that's the first step. Vitaly may not remember that he said that once at a conference, but he actually said this. I have it written down here. Be at the table or make your own table so that they would come. I would say, bring your own table. Um, by changing the culture of evidence gathering, the type of evidence we gather, so that we can make the right decisions to focus on the, you know, at the very beginning. And sometimes it's okay to get things wrong first because we need to do a thing wrong first sometimes just before we can get it right. But we have to learn to build that pathway so that we have the communication chain right up to the top and, and then be able to make that change. Many of you are probably familiar with the double diamond. And so it's like formalized by the Design Council in the UK here in 2005. The idea is to capture the divergence of ideas before converging on a solution, then diverging again to formalize solutions and narrowing down to its an implementation. So discover insight into a problem, defining an area to focus, develop potential solutions, develop solutions that work. Not necessarily a no, left to right time-based process, um, but it's sort of the, the description of that thinking. And one of the easiest way for me that I've always been teaching this is it's like thinking about it in terms of the problem space and the solution space. On the left hand side, the left hand diamond is we think about designing and building the right thing. On the solution space is you know, um, on the right hand side, designing and building the thing right. And it's so essential not to confuse the two because what happens and all the stories that I'm about to tell you today, in most cases in the industry, we always build first. We always start in the middle of the second diamond rather than think about 
the space that we're trying to play in, or we do just enough a little bit and without really thinking about the consequences of what it means. So we, we often sort of start at that second point in the diamond and assume that we know everything else and to reinforce that solution that we've got is the right one. But usually when you build something, however lightweight, you're gonna be attached to the idea. So imagine ideas are, you know, how ideas grow, they're like a tree. Unless you have a framework for evaluating if a thing you try fits the bill, behavioral economics shows us that you know, we can get attached to decisions we make. Even the most rational of us would suffer from that seduction of the ownership of an idea. And we need to get better at sort of positioning, um, gathering ideas at that source. Because once we spend the time, the effort and the cash on something, it's a lot harder to pivot away from. Because we need to justify to ourselves that our blood, sweat and tears have not been wasted. Begin with intentional evidence and not design. Um, this was uh, something that Stanley Wood said when he was still the design director at Spotify um, in an interview with Aaron Walter when Aaron was still at um, Envision. This is an important lesson for me. I learned to sell the problem before the solution to activate change. I've always sold change by selling solutions and then finding myself stuck debating and defending why it was so much better than what existed. The curse of being a designer is you often jump into problem solving mode. I now try my best to always ensure there's demand for the problem before supplying any solutions. So design research can provide different types of evidence to than traditional market research or data science, rich in context and nuance. But it's also so much more than just usability. Usability is the optimization part of it, the making the thing right. What about the diamond before and the three quarters of the diamonds in the structure before? So here's another way to think about it. I'm not the only one who coined it this way, but I think of it as pace layers. It's a great little term about things working at different speeds. It's a way about thinking about the right questions at the right level. So at the brand level, what's our story? And are, do users understand what our stories are? And does that match to their user experience of this product that we've built? The value proposition, what's the promise we're making? The product is the thing that we're building, fulfilling that promise. The features, the journey, can the users complete their tasks, do the thing they want to do, achieve their goals? And the user, user interface, can the users use it? Um, and so, and you imagine down the bottom there is where usability um, tests might sit, but the kinds of questions that you can ask in research is this whole stack. And um, yes, when you conduct things right, you can do research that you know, deals with several layers in the stack simultaneously, but you know, these, each of these are different levels of questions. And um, the, way I, the reason why I split this way is you may have a brand story and in your brand story, you may be making different types of promises. Um, and for each value proposition, for each promise, you might have different products that satisfy that value proposition. And for that product, you may have different features and so forth and so forth. So you see how things sort of, you know, sort of fit within each other. But in terms of methods, there's a range of them. And um, this is a very old uh, and a well-known chart um, at Nielsen Norman, where we looked at splitting in terms of qualitative, quantitative, attitudinal, what people say, behavioral, what people do, and the different types of methods that are better at bringing out this type of evidence. One of the other ways that I started thinking about it very much is sort of double with diamond thinking, and also partly to help um, making sure that we don't catch ourselves too much in when we decide what to do, is this idea of some methods bring you much more open-ended evidence and others bring close-ended. I'll start with this sort of the A-B testing. So most of you probably would know what that is. You know, you've got version A, version B of a design, which one performs better? A, B. Um, so this is like kind of like a binary type, you know, answer and get in the end. On the other hand, if I've packed my bags and went to study somebody institute in their situation where they, I don't know, I would order pizza, use a software, how they're in their workspace, um, that is so much more open-ended. I'm gonna find a lot more things which I probably don't even have assumptions for. And those are very open-ended methods that bring back sort of more ethnographic evidence. And so as a result, the open-ended ones are, are good for so like formative, generative type method, um, <clears throat> evident, um, types of research. And on the other side, we're looking at more optimization based. So 
I'm going to tell you a few stories um, that kind of start here. But then because we started at the wrong point, we ended up reframing the problem. So just a few short research case stories to spark your imagination. Um, there was a startup that came to talk to me. Um, oh, I don't know how many years this was. Um, they came to me after a conference talk I gave, which was also quite unusual. Um, and they were building, they had a prototype, but they wanted to just validate any ex assumptions they had about whether people would receive and digital gifts, uh, receive and give digital gifts in a different um, experience, and what would that experience look like? So we wanted to arrive at a clear idea of how people interact with this beyond the current existing technology. So it's quite forward looking, and um, they wanted to make this quite unique. So we set up a piece of research where we have four senders, four receivers, people who have received uh, or, or sent digital gifts within the last three months because they have to remember the experience. Um, and then who use, you know, who use a mobile device because that's what they're going to have to use. Um, and we ask quite open-ended interviews where it makes, like, we, we ask for their stories. Who gave them a gift? Who did they send it to? How did they feel about the experience? And then we had this thing where I got them to, you know, as you can see in this image, where I gave them pens and we had stickies and we just like prototype the experience that they would prefer to have. Um, and um, and so I'm going to show you another one where it's like so these were them like you know, trying to draw their perceptions and mental models, and we have this strong visual evidence that I know that by the time that you know, the research was done, a designer can watch the videos and has a really good idea of what could be built that's different from what exists today because we talked to people and we got them to ideate with us, um, and we got them to play the prototype as well. So. <clears throat> And um, this particular one was um, a, a small piece of research that we did with um, London government, um, where it was on a platform where we looked at, so this platform allow people to sort of feedback on London city policy. And um, the, the probably interesting part was how we recruited them. Um, we spoke to London, the people who were part of the forum, and then people who were not part of the forum, those were hard to find. We spoke to people who, we had to find people who were passionate about the environment, about recycling, about you know, cycle lanes, pollution, and like that. And in, so that they, the same profile of people who may engage, but they are not on the platform yet. So that was a tricky part. But we asked them, you no, know, the, the premise of this project was we needed to port the site into a different place and we had a new template. And we, want, and we used the opportunity to check the promise and the value proposition. Did they trust, would they engage? Do they, and, and having to make that distinction between trusting the platform and trusting the government. So it was quite tricky. But here's a case where we started with a concept, but brought the concept back to look at understanding people's motivations and how they would engage with issues. And so we brought back quite a lot of high level, um, um, high level insights, but at the same time, able to directly map them into what the interface could look like. One last interesting story. Um, a client that we worked for, and I'm sorry, we can't name them. I haven't you know, named too many of them. We started on a project in the second quarter of the diamond, exactly that point, because they had to prove internally within the company that they had the technical capability to carry an idea forward, and they had to show that it was technically possible. Unfortunately, when we, our design team, looked at that prototype, we knew it wasn't going to work. It was so full of usability issues that testing it would have been moot. And again, the solution had already been defined. So it's like, okay, let's do this research slightly differently. So the way we did it was we kind of exploded the solution and tested its boundary. We basically took that as a gist and exploded them. Basically imagined doing crazy eights over something that already existed. What this project was about was a marketing campaign of a kind to short circuit an onboarding process into a subscription offering. So, so imagine, you know, the thing where you sign up to a new service, um, uh, you know, you have to give your credit card details, you get 30 days free or whatever, 14 days free, and, and then before they start charging you. So that was basically the journey that we were testing, but in a very special context for a different product. They were hoping to be able to just like give people a taste of what they would be paying for before they charge them. Um, so this is a, just a, a way to sort of help them maybe hook people more to see if they can grow more subscribers more quickly. The model is not new, but the execution of this particular project was quite unusual. 
um, in the way that it involved physical spaces. So, okay, I'll just leave it at that. So we came up with a way of rapidly iterative testing the boundaries of this proposition. My co-researcher and I, this was so memorable, we were very, very, very tired at the end. I probably won't do this the same way again because it was so grueling. We had two weeks. We loved cameras, a recorder, a portable printer around London and Brighton. We tested copy and combinations of copy. We made prototypes on the train in between research rounds. And then we just show people stuff and just testing to see if people responded to different texts, different interactions. And so we're continually refining our assumptions very quickly. What would make people understand the value pro proposition better straight up like that? We tested with people in the street, we tested in venues, we recruited for people who didn't know the brand well. Um, so we'd like split the, the research into two parts. The first week we just did like this rapid dirty iterating stuff, like just tried a you know, bunch of stuff and, and sort of narrowed down our assumptions. In the second week, we kind of knew what was going to work. So it's really mostly more refining it. We also specially recruited a set of people because who didn't know the brand. Um, and so just to see where the consistency it was a lot of work. But here's the thing. In all these stories, can you imagine what effort we might have saved if we asked the right questions before building the wrong thing? A lot of time. And we might have probably built something better. One of the side effects of research is that you often end up being a bearer of bad news. But in that last story I just showed you, instead of doing that, one of the, the ways we did it was to think about research differently. So you gear up the research to find out what will work instead. And what we were able to do was quite specific. We were able to tell you this proposition is going to work in these type of locations with this type of copy and this type of language and why. I can't tell you what we learned because that's trade secret, but the one thing that is amazed me because this is something that I think is common to many of us and to services that we built. Um, People of all ages, of all contexts, will only let themselves be scammed once. Everybody who didn't know the brand was skeptical of being offered something for free. And the majority of people refused to enter their credit card information, was constantly checking for reassurances that no payment would be taken without their knowledge. And just a year ago, actually, from now, I actually did another round of research that has you know, touching on the same notes about subscription. And I can tell you, people have gone so much more savvy. I want to say that this sort of stuff gives me heart and hope and, and why I continue doing the work that I do. And is why we should continue to do primary discovery research because the interface that we build is only one touch point. Um, the motivation for why we use something happens so much earlier. And so we should constantly just check in with each other as human beings. And human beings are such so adaptable. What sucks today, we'll find a way around it. Our behaviors change as our barometers change. And this is why we shouldn't make assumptions about any users we're designing for. Line up your Trojan horses. Number one, every piece of research that you do is a potential of Trojan horse. So for me, I've come to realize that everything that I'm doing, you know, is maybe less now because I'm of where I am, but it's really around educating people on how you might be able to build the right thing. And even though we started here, we always brought questions and insights that drove the conversation back this way. So now we just, you know, once we do it a few times, people will realize that it would be so much more efficient if we start in the first diamond. Number two, translate user insights into business insights. Get the right kind of evidence in order to do that, to have that conversation. And remember that pace layer, when you build something, does it erode the brand or the trust the users have in you? That's super important. And, you know, and also I know that Vitaly in the past has talked about the personality of your app. Um, that is also, that's important. Does this fit into the shape of the promise that you as a business or an organization is making to your customer? And how does this affect the, the perceived notions of value and cost? Now, those are questions, are eternal questions that we can ask as businesses. Number three, scaling up research. Involve more people to do more of it. Um, so I, Christopher, who wrote an article here, Achieve More Research More Frequently, um, he, he's got the best points. Um, 
plan for iterative research, full transparency before, during, after research, encourage crossing participation, make sales marketing service teams your allies. I actually go for and say make everybody your ally. Um, provide customer feedback to executive stakeholders, basically bring up the voice of the customer. The research, the entire research to larger business needs, basically understand the business model of the organization that you're designing for, you're working within. Don't pull the leather up. Um, teach everyone, democratize how that how to do research. And the other part for me is operationalize as much as you can. Steve Portugal, um, uh, very senior, awesome researcher based on San Francisco, um, said this, the Trojan horse is efficiency. By building infrastructure, we lower barriers to entry and risk so people can learn from experiments and be persuaded by examples of success. And for me, it's about you know, teaching. Some of my colleagues are not researchers, but they can do research. No, they're human. Um, just to, I just need to make, it's my job to make it easy for them to do good research well, frequently and consistently. Number five, advocate for a continuous learning culture. When I was working with Aaron Walter back at Notchum, um, he's he used these words about the you know, wisdom, gathering wisdom about your customers, about your users. Um, in more technical terms, when it comes to research, I think about it as like ever improving user model, like creating this internal knowledge about knowing who your customers are um, through different forms of research. So with each round, you're building a, a much richer picture about about your users, the clients, the students that you're serving. One last point, be mindful of where decisions are made and who makes them. Tomorrow or later today, or when you go back to your world of work, it's interesting maybe to reflect on the right governance level of where you're working with it. Examine the way decisions are made, who makes them, and find ways of how you might speak to them in their language with the evidence that you can bring. Just remember something, um, design is power. And it's our job to give power to our users, to our customers, and to our citizens. Thank you very much. That's all for me. And here we go. Thank you so much, Steph, for the wonderful session. It was nice to see a few quotes from me. I, I indeed did not remember that I ever said something of that kind, but it's very kind that you remember. Right. Um, you had a couple of things in your session. And by the way, there was a wonderful session. Thank you so much for all this. Um, I think one thing that you said in the very end was really resonating with me because this is something that I have ended up struggling with, uh, which is speaking the language of, you know, whoever you're dealing with uh, in the end. Um, I think very often it's that I'm struggling with really is to find that way of tapping into the language that they will understand and they will want to speak with me. So maybe you could, spare, or you could share a little bit of more insight about how do you find that particular language? And you know, I guess we need to speak about the KPIs that they are driven by and so on. That kind of requires a research on its own, right? So maybe you could just share a little bit of your strategy to get there. Um, you know, when, when we showed up here in the beginning, you said, do you do you dream of research? And I guess I must do, because for me, when I go to an organization, um, the stakeholders I'm having to deal with, that is research. They are, they are going to be the users of my research outputs. So I, and I go and understand how, what is their mental model? How do they think about the world? Um, what is, you know, what language do they use? Do they, uh, what, what is important to them? Like, do they have, you know, like you said, KPIs, OKRs, those magic three, you know, three letter acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, but so I guess the difference is also whether those actually make a difference because, like, some teams I've seen have KPIs and OKRs, they don't actually map to impact. Um, so, I guess it's to establish how, what I said at the end, I, I suppose, is some of the things I have been thinking is um, when I go into a situation like that, the, the read is to look at the power dynamics, who calls the shots. Like I said, so and and what language do they use? Are they the kind and maybe look into their background? Are they from technical engineering? And therefore, maybe like certain number, maybe they like numbers better than stories. I know this is funny because like people will say they like numbers better than stories, but actually stories change people's minds more. So in the end, if somebody um, who's the kind who likes charts and numbers and graphs 
you still have to learn how to tell a story of the data, but you just have to learn to tell a story of the quantitative data and the type of data. I don't know if we've got time to go into an example. Is that okay? Um, yeah, um, I think we have a couple of minutes. Yes, if you want. Okay. To. So in in a recent in a recent piece of work that I collaborated with a data scientist, and I I, I really love these kinds of collaborations because it always feels like me. Sorry, this is not scientifically correct. Like left brain, right brain, it's not quite like that. It's it's really about sort of the mixed methods, um, where we bring in different parts of the argument. And so we were trying to convince a stakeholder that the route we were going down was not the right bet. But instead of making saying this is wrong, we said, okay, let's look at all the options. Let's map out. Let's model out all the options in our interviews, which I conducted. And they looked at sort of like app usage and they looked at um, things like revenue models. And we just like put it all together. And then we put it in front of everyone and said, OK, so they have these three options. Um, what do you think our best bet is? Leonard? And so what happens is we, we, we have concrete, solid data, qualitative and quant, mixed methods. But the story is completed in the stakeholder's mind. And that was how we possibly stopped the company from failing. Uh, um, uh, and mm -hmm. that that is the kind of power that you have to bring through storytelling in data. But that's probably a different talk, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll find time for that as well. Uh, maybe we just have two more minutes and then I'm going to look up if there are any questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, not yet, I think. But dear friends, if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to pick them up. Uh, one thing that you did maybe mention, but I wanted to kind of drop in, uh, in a little bit more on that, because you mentioned that you did some jobs to be done research, but you would be very happy to elaborate a little bit more about that in the conversation <laughs> later. So I'm picking this up very diligently. Uh, so is there anything you would like to share about the approach? Maybe not everybody's <clears throat> familiar with it as well. Oh, goodness. This is like a whole day long workshop. I know. Itself, easily. Um, or, or more, really, to be honest. Um, it's... So jobs to be done um, historically came from market research. Um, and it is the type of research that looks at stories and context. Um, there are several flavors of it. Um, so if you follow Jared Spool, you probably have heard about all the sort of the way he thinks about jobs to be done, but there's only one way. He, he just, he likes to stir it up a little bit. Um, uh, we, they, you can think of it as um, what your end goal is trying to be. And jobs to be done is just a framework for you to sort of map either get closer to the ultimate why or get downwards to the tasks you have to do in order to achieve the why. And so it's just a framework that allows you to do that. And there are several philosophies and approaches to help you get, yeah. the, get the journey and, um, and make sense of it. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much. But I have just one more question. I think at Amanda just, oh, one more question. But I do have one <laughs> more question, just one final one. What would you say sure. in a setting? Where would you actually recommend people to start if they happen to be in an environment where everything is MVP driven? So let's just build it out the thing and release it and see if it works. And then we'll do all the other stuff, all the research and everything that needs to be done later. Right. So what would be your approach to fight against that? Um, it would be one of those things where um, make sure that the way you conduct your, basically don't limit yourself to usability testing. I mean, it's so the moment you open up your questions, like try and try and separate out what is an assumption and what is not an what is open for debate. Um, and and you, the problem is if you have the MVP culture, it's going to take a little while. And I want to say from past experience, it can take up to eighteen months. So hanging there, if you <laughs> it can take a team like that up to eighteen months to shift their culture. But it is doable and it has been done. Um, so you just need to start somewhere. Um, yes, do the usability testing, but that is the, but try and open up the conversation with the users as much as possible, try and get their motivations um, and, and try and to understand their needs and their frustrations in the real life context as much as possible. All right. Well, with this in mind, thank you so much, Steph, for being with us. Uh, dear friends joining us, don't forget that we still have a panel that is going to be happening or taking place after the third session. We have two more sessions to go. We have one by our friends from Balsamic Case Study about the real messy world. And then we also have one session on e-commerce and some of the interesting research done there. So, uh, Steph, thank you so much for joining. Everybody, please thank give you. a very warm and very loud 
if it's even possible, a uh, round of clap emoji <laughs> in the chat. And I'm sure that uh, Stephanie will be following there along as well. Thank you so much for being with us, Steph.